And there is now sticking up over here, and that can cause issues. That, that could fall over and lead to a bridge. It can leave you with an insufficient here on the toe or the heel, depending on which direction that's put, being put. Um, and so you need to look at that as well. Um, so another thing we've talked about, and this is something that's measured for every paste, and really there's not, in the last few years, I'd say not a huge uh, impact, but something that's still done is, is tack life. And I say not a huge impact, in other words, pretty much every paste is going to have a good tack life. Uh, where tack life can be affected goes back to the rheology. Okay, so if you beat the paste up a lot um, and you shear thin the heck out of it, you can't actually lose some, some tack force. But most of them uh, are last well beyond 24 hours. And this is, you know, tack tester. You basically take a flat paddle, stick it in the paste, pull it up. Is it tacky enough to hold a component as it goes through the pick and place process? And by and large, most pastes easily meet the 24 hour criteria as they're manufactured. But in the process, as you're, one of the things you may want to think about is if you're putting a large amount of force onto that paste over and over, and you're not using up a lot, of, not replenishing a lot for whatever reason, you may ha eventually have an effect on tack force. And so it's something to consider as you go through the process. Uh, stencil and, and open time. So how long can you continuously be using it on the stencil? Uh, solvent loss and moisture pickup are, are certainly factors. And once again, that work life again is a factor. A lot of times what we'll do when we're developing a new material is we'll, we'll do a, a look at a volume at time zero and we'll just run that printer continuously for four hours or eight hours and we just just run it, just put the paste on it and just beat the snot out of it, okay? And then we'll look at the volume and the consistency afterwards, okay? And we'll do a rheology check before and after. And one of the things we're looking for is that hysteresis curve. We know it happens, but how far down does it go? Does it go down far enough to affect the performance or does it just drop just a little bit and so you still get good, nice deposits, consistent deposits after that work time? And so in your facility, if you're evaluating a new material, one of the things you may be thinking about is, Let's see, we usually run eight hours or 12 hours or four hours or whatever it may be. You might want to run, take your paste and run it through this and say, okay, print one and then just run it for four hours. We just, we just do a couple boards and just keep cycling them through. The idea is just to beat up the paste and then measure it at four, measure it at eight and say, okay, how close is that volume to where I started? Okay, you can expect a slight difference, but you don't want it to be outside your, outside your control limits. Okay. Uh, Abandon time. Uh, how long can you leave the paste between prints? So we're shear thinning and we're recovering. We're shear thinning and recovering. So the question is, sometimes in inverse hysteresis where you actually get it thicker and thicker, not often, but uh, a lot of times with this, I, you know, you're printing uh, something down the line, goes an alarm, you gotta fix a piece of equipment, a sales guy comes in, takes you out for lunch for a couple hours. Um, you know, usually some of the sales guys here laughs when I say that. Um, so, you know, you want to be able to leave that paste, come back to it, print, and everything should be fine. Okay, no one wants to come back, well, I have to go through a neat cycle or I have to do this. You want it to come back and boom, be printing again. You want that effect as soon as you put that shear force on it, shear thin it, fill the apertures, leave a good deposit, and everything is well and good. Um, some of the process terms that, that can affect it, uh, downstop, or pressure, speed, these all affect the amount of force that we're putting on the paste, okay? And there can be too much force, okay? So really what you wanna do when you're setting up your process, and I'll, I'll show you some examples. What we usually do, if I'm, if I'm going into either an evaluation or either internal or external, you know, a couple things I do. The first thing I do is I look at the stencil. Pull it out, look at it through light, make sure it's not all gummed up. Because I don't wanna start with a bad stencil to begin with and then screw up all the results I'm gonna get. Right, so make sure that's all clean and good. And then put it in the, you know, put it in the stencil, make sure the gasket is good and all that stuff. But on the print process side, I start with the lowest pressure and the slowest speed. Or if there's a speed target, say, okay, say you gotta print 100 millimeters a second, that's what you guys print, okay, we'll start there. with the lowest pressure possible and then slowly walk, work it up until I get a clean sweep. Okay, there's no point in driving that pressure and that speed as fast and as hard as you can. And you might get a good print and it might look fine but the, you're putting more energy into that paste. And the more energy you put in that paste, the more the shear force you put in that paste, the faster you degrade it. And so if you want that paste to last for a longer time on your stencil, start off on the low end, give yourself what you need to get a good print deposit, maybe give yourself a little bit more speed or pressure, okay, and those two are interrelated. You can't, if you're changing one of them, you gotta change the other if you want the same amount of force 
on that page. So they're related. All three of them are related together. The print speed, the print pressure, and the energy you're putting into the paste. Okay, so you gotta kinda tweak those variables together. Get yourself that good deposit. Like I said, usually add a little bit to give yourself some window, and then you're good. Uh, snap off, uh, some printers use this term. It's the distance between the, the board and the stencil. You really want this to be zero. Uh, do not recommend off contact printing for paste. Uh, it leads to a lot of variation. It leads to a lot of weird, squirrely deposits with dog ears or with unreleased. I mean, one of the things that you want is the board's up against that stencil, you're printing, you're filling those apertures, okay? And actually, that, that contact between the pad and the paste plays a role in getting that paste to release. Okay, the paste is sticking to the board. If you talk about uh, aspect ratio uh, with the stencil, one of the things you're looking at is what's the area of the pad that I'm printing on versus the walls of the stencil. You want that pad to be larger because you want the paste to stick to that and not to the stencil. Well, if your board's, you know, a millimeter or less away, if it's not touching the paste, why would it leave the stencil? It's gonna stay, it's gonna stick to the walls of the stencil and say, I'm happy where I'm at, I'm not going anywhere. Okay, so off contact printing can lead to, or if you got, you know, sometimes you get this kind of like a little bit of a, you get off contact except when the blade comes by, right? And then you're putting pressure and then it kind of peels it, you get that bowing. So you kind of get like a scooping effect. So you get paste at the edges but lower in the middle. And if you're doing, inspection's not measuring volume, it's just measuring is it there? Yeah, there's paste there, but is it enough to really solder or give the solder joint that you expected to get out of your design or what your expectations are? So that's important. Uh, separation speed is, you know, pulling that board away. Once again, another way of inducing shear force on the paste to get it to release. Uh, and then tooling. How do you support the circuit board? Um, that's really important. Uh, a lot of defects come up that way where you're not supporting one area of the board or you're over supporting, could be pushing it upwards, which I'll show you some, some cartoons of how that can have an effect. So this is a material that we designed back in 90, maybe 2000. So this is a, a, what we call, this is our process window. So you're looking at, mentioned that speed and pressure are related. Okay, so at different speeds, you want a different pressure and the green area is all happy and everything else is not. Okay, and so there's some pictures of defects here, optimum printing, but you know, here in the red, we're getting some you know, really crappy deposits uh, here once again. Down here, you basically don't get anything. Um, you're getting skidding and at the fast end of the speed here, the paste didn't even fill the apertures. And so, you know, with our paste, we created this process window. We said, okay, if you're using this material, recommend at 100 millimeters a second, be somewhere about, you know, 7 kg or 6.5, 6.8 kg. Um, and obviously, you look at the board size and everything else, but it's a good starting point, okay? What you don't want to do is have your process right here. Because, you know, and we all know we set up our process and they never change, right? No one ever goes up to the printer and tweaks it and thinks, well, today it's my printer and I'm going to print this way. You know, everyone's got their own ideas on the best way to do stuff. And they have their own improvements. Um, so it's always with good intentions that they screw up everything. Um, so you usually want to be somewhere in the middle of the ranges here. So if you know what your window is for your material, try to put it in the middle so that you don't uh, um, end up on the edges where you can run into some issues. Now, today, our print windows tend to be a little wider. Um, you can see where we've gotten to the point where the materials um, tend to have a pretty large green area and a little bit down here in the very fast speeds and low pressures. Uh, but you can see overall these pressures are higher, speeds are a little bit higher. But it's still, it's still important that you don't play around down here in the corners. You still want to be somewhere up here in the middle. So we talked a little bit about paste rheology. Okay, so why is, why is the rheology important? Anybody answer that? See, this is when you guys start falling asleep, I'm going to start asking you questions. <laughs> so why is the rheology important? What is it? How well the paste fills the apertures as you shear thin it? Okay, powder size. Why does the powder size matter? Fit through the apertures, okay. So why, so why not just go with a smaller powder size for everything? Breaks down faster, oxidation, okay. Price, cost. No, never, no, no, pay more, it's okay. Nope, cost is another one, okay. So, and they all interact with the speed and the pressure like we just talked about, okay. So, a lot of factors 
that affect the process, right? We talked about, um, we're talking about pace, but there are hardware factors, the stencils, the squeegees, the tooling and the support, uh, speed and pressure, and the board itself can actually affect your print process. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about these. I think I pulled out the stencil and squeegee stuff. I think it's being covered somewhere else. A um, little bit just real briefly, does anyone use polyurethane squeegees anymore for printing paste? I think for the most part they're gone. I see them once in a while for adhesive still. Um, most everybody uses stainless steel or some metal with some coating of, of what different consistencies and things like that. Um, not really going to cover that. That's why. Not that people stand on their stencil, but if they did, then they were very small. Uh, the polyurethane blades typically they tend to f they tend to bend and end up scooping. If you put you got to put just the right amount of pressure on them. So even though there's harder durometer ones, the metal blades tend to work a little bit better. One of the other things that I've seen before is the, the length of the squeegee, right? So the squeegee is just as wide as the board, okay? Or even better, when it's smaller than the board. Okay, well, the edges don't matter so much, and it, it, you really want good, even, consistent pressure <coughs> over that entire roll of paste that's filling the apertures that are going to be on the board. Okay, so what we recommend when we're working with folks is that that squeegee is at least a half an inch to an inch or two inches beyond the edge of the board. So if this board is, you know, nine inches across, you know, you want that squeegee to be 10 or 11 inches. Okay, you want it to be over the edges of the board. You don't want it to be just, because there are some edge effects that happen. Um, and so the paste that's right on the edge corner, if you print, you'll see that strip, usually a line of paste that's on the edge, okay? Um, there's some weird things that happen at the edge when it's rolling and everything else. If you have any pads or apertures that have been filled from paste on the edge, it, it's not always gonna get good fill and everything else. So you really want that blade to be wider than the board itself. So you get good, even, consistent pressure and speed across the whole uh, roll of paste that's filling the apertures for the print process. Otherwise you get, you know, this is a really good example of where the